Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Welcome to um, the patient meeting of the Fibromuscular Dysplasia Society of America. Uh, I can't tell you how important the work of F FMDSA has been. Um, they have done much more to increase awareness than anything any of us have done with the papers we've written about fibromuscular dysplasia. Um, let's see if I can get my slides up here. Excuse me, guys, sorry. Okay, so I've been asked to talk about what is fibromuscular dysplasia and how does it um, differ from patients who have many features of fibromuscular dysplasia but don't quite meet the criteria for it? I will tell you that about 50% of all patients sent to me or self-referred with a diagnosis of fibromuscular dysplasia do not have it according to the way that we now define it. Now, I just want to start with this picture. This happens to be an arteriogram. This is a wire in the artery to the kidney. And you can see the classic findings of the most common type of fibromuscular dysplasia, the so-called string of beads type. This is a normal arterial segment. Hey, Dr. Um, Olin, can yes. I interrupt you for one second? They cannot see your slides. Okay. Um, can I get some help from... Um, Steam yard. I guess not. So, Jeff, can you see the messages at the side um, of the screen? Wait a second. He said, start the share screen. I thought I did that. Um, so, everyone, this has been a learning curve for all of us. And, uh, and the FMDSA uh, server went down last night, so it's been a rough couple hours this morning okay. trying to figure that out. I'm trying to get to the share screen. Steam your Chrome. Sorry, guys. Somehow, I am not. Can you share the screen, Jeff? I can't get to even the page where it says to share. It. Uh, he said to open your presentation in the full screen mode. Yeah, that's what I had, but. All right, let's see here. Can you see me now? I can see you, we just can't see you. So he's saying to open the presentation in full screen mode. Yeah, can you see that? 
Would you like to, um, oh, there you go. You got it. Can you see it now? Yes. Yes. Okay. I apologize. I'm going to start over. Um, so we're going to run just a bit late. Okay. I don't know how much anyone saw, but this is what typical fibromuscular dysplasia looks like. This is the so-called string of beads. This happens to be a catheter in the artery to the right kidney. And what you can see here is the so-called string of beads. You have areas of narrowing alternating with areas of enlargement. This, this segment here is what a normal renal artery looks like. So this is the most common type of fibromuscular dysplasia, the multifocal type. Now, I don't know how many of you know this, but there's actually a plant called the FMD plant. And you can see, true to its common name, the string of pearls, and the name of the plant is the South African species with succulent pea side and shaped leaves that cascade over the pot edge. I thought this was kind of nice to see a plant model of fibromuscular dysplasia. I know that Jason and I have been working with a mouse model of fibromuscular dysplasia. Well, in 2019, Heather Gornick, Alexander Pursue, myself, and Pierre-Francois Plouin got a group together and published the first international consensus conference on fibromuscular dysplasia. And to define it for you, it's a non-atherosclerotic, meaning it's not your typical hardening of the arteries, that's characterized by abnormal proliferation of cells inside the artery that distort the architecture of the artery. And it primarily manifests in one of two ways, as multifocal or focal lesions uh, in medium and small sized arteries. There are two types of FMD, multifocal string of beads, focal, focal areas of narrowing. So here's an example of multifocal in a carotid artery, the main artery that supplies the brain. And you can see here the string of beads and where the red arrow is, you can see that uh, the artery is normal. And here is a kidney uh, example of the string of beads type. This patient actually had high pressure, underwent angioplasty. So the middle frame is the balloon that is expanded. And the frame on the right shows that the artery returns to a configuration that looks like normal. All these little webs inside the artery were disrupted and therefore you have normal flow in the kidney artery and with the goal of improving or curing high blood pressure. Now here's the other less common type. This is focal FMD. It usually occurs in younger women, ages let's say 25 to 30, you can see it's a focal area of severe narrowing. But recently we've been seeing, we've seen four cases now of focal FMD in men in their mid fifties. And this is a tub tubular narrowing of the artery to the kidney. And generally these respond well to angioplasty. So the arterial manifestations of fibromuscular dysplasia are demonstrated here. The string of beads and the focal concentric stenosis, you require one of those to make the diagnosis of FMD. All these other things that you see, dissection, that's a tear in the artery, ectasia, that's an enlargement of the artery, aneurysm, that's even a larger enlargement of the artery, and tortuosity or curviness of the artery. These all occur in FMD, but they occur in other conditions as well, and they're not specific for FMD. So part of the FMD-like patients, the ones who come to see us thinking they have FMD, but they don't meet the criteria because they don't have either the string of beads or the area of stenosis, but they may have all these other manifestations that you see on this particular slide. Um, here is an interesting, uh, situation. I saw this woman many years ago and she was referred to me for swollen legs. And when I listened to her neck, I heard a loud brewery. A, a brewery is a sound produced in an artery due to turbulence of flow. No doctor ever listened to her neck. And you can see it's very high up. 
This area down here is at the angle of your jaw. So you can see how high up this is. And uh, she ended up having focal fibromuscular dysplasia. And when questioned, she had a long history of pulsatile tinnitus. That's a swooshing or whooshing sound in your ear. And I'm going to play that for you in, in a minute or two. Um, as long as she could remember. And she was never diagnosed. And um, this is an all too common manifestation. Now, in 2014, after we published our first paper in 2012, Heather and I co-chaired this paper on the state of the art in, from the American Heart Association. And in 2019, Heather and Alexander Pursue co-chaired this paper on the first international consensus on the diagnosis and management of FMD. And we've learned a lot of information from our registry and the registry of our European colleagues. And um, there's been a lot of cross fertilization occurring um, regarding uh, things we've observed and that they've observed. Now, what about this FMD like syndrome? Um, here are three sisters. Now, I saw sister one first. Sister one had tortuous or curvy internal carotid arteries and had a aneurysm of the artery to the spleen. Sister two had the typical string of beads in the arteries in her neck, in the arteries to her kidney, and in the arteries to her legs. And sister three had string of beads of the arteries to her neck, a spontaneous coronary artery dissection scad of the mid left anterior descending coronary artery and ectasia of the celiac artery, which supplies the liver and spleen. So sister one doesn't meet the criteria for FMD. We can't put her in the registry because she doesn't have string of beads or areas of stenosis. But it's inconceivable to think that this woman doesn't have FMD. I mean, two of her sisters have it, and she has other phenotypic presentations of it. But as of yet, we cannot call it FMD. The natural history and the behavior of this is exactly the same as someone with FMD, but she can't be labeled that in the absence of beating or stenosis. Here's her um, splenic artery aneurysms. And here's the string of beads in the carotid arteries of the other sisters, the iliac arteries, an enlargement of the celiac artery, and her spontaneous coronary artery dissection of the left anterior descending. You're going to hear much more about this from Dr. Uh, Esther Kim um, later on today. Now, we, uh, one of the contributions that we have made in the registry is, is pointing out how common aneurysms and dissections are. This is a CT angiogram showing uh, the renal arteries where you have several aneurysms, one here, one here, one down here. And this is a dissection. You see this line in the vertebral artery? That means that artery is torn and blood is flowing in two channels. So that's what a dissection is. And we demonstrated, as I'll show you in a paper, uh, how common this really is. So um, after we published the paper on aneurysms and dissections, uh, my colleague, Dr. Katie Godolf and I wrote an editorial looking beyond the string of beads. And then um, later that year, in response to a paper uh, from the group in Paris, we uh, wrote this editorial expanding the clinical phenotype. The clinical phenotype is like how the patient presents in fibromuscular dysplasia. In the literature prior to 1990, when the renal arteries were affected, patients presented with hypertension and carotid arteries were never even imaged. However, since the first publication of the United States Registry for Fibromuscular Dys Dysplasia, the clinical phenotype has expanded from a rare cause of renal vascular hypertension in young women to now include a variety of anatomic and clinical manifestations. And I remember our first trip to Paris 
when we presented our data to the uh, group at George Pompidou Hospital um, and showed them how common carotid artery involvement was. And then they started checking for carotid artery involvement and it's spread across the world in that way. So here's just a pictorial description of string of beads, focal area of narrowing, arterial tortuosity, look at this, uh, artery um, like in an S curve, a dissection or a tear in the artery, spontaneous coronary artery uh, dissection and aneurysms. All of these can occur in fibromuscular dysplasia. On the left is a carotid duplex ultrasound. But in order to see this, you have to look very high up and many labs don't look beyond the area of the carotid bifurcation. But this is up here. This is a physician who had an ischemic stroke, um, not from this, but her contralateral carotid artery dissected and occluded. And now she has this extremely tortuous right internal carotid artery, what we've called the S-curve, um, a novel morphological finding in fibromuscular dysplasia. So um, you can see here that the first description of vascular tortuosity can be found in um, Leonardo da Vinci's anatomic drawings where he um, described the process of aging of superficial vessels of the arm as tortuous in the old as opposed to the vessels of the young, which is straight. Well. In FMD, it's tortuous in the young. In other words, tortuosity, if you're elderly, can be normal, but it is not normal in individuals less than 70 years old. And here's the, the paper, the superficial veins of the left arm or the painting of the vessels of the young and the old. Tortuosity is not specific for FMD. It can occur in a number of genetic diseases, some of which I've listed here. So this all started uh, when Pam and I um, started the uh, FMD registry. Um, we got Heather and the group at the Cleveland Clinic involved, and we started with, I forget, seven or nine centers. And we published our first paper in 2012 in a very high-impact journal uh, in the first 447 patients. This is the largest series at the time that been published with FMD. Everything I learned as a fellow was incorrect regarding this disease. I was taught it occurs in women between the ages of 20 and 30. Well, the mean age at diagnosis was 52 years. 60% um, had hypertension, 50% had a headache of which migraines predominate. And the same gene occurs with migraine headaches as occurs with FMD. You'll hear more about that later. 27% um, presented with pulsatile tinnitus. But how often do doctors ask their patients, do you have any ringing of your ears? Do you have any swooshing or whooshing in your ears? And then some patients present with dizziness. And then here are some of the bad things that can occur. Fortunately, they occur less frequently transient ischemic attack, stroke, dissections of the renal arteries. So pulsatile tinnitus occurs in somewhere between 25 and 30% of patients um, uh, with FMD. And when they try to tell their patients, or their doctors that they have this, the doctors, many of them don't believe them. So many of these patients have started recording the sounds using their um, iPhones to convince the physician that in fact, they have something like swooshing or whooshing sound in their ears. Now let's see if this plays correctly and if you can hear it. You'll hear artifact at first and then you'll hear <laughs> artifact. And you're, there you can hear the pulsatile tinnitus. This drives people crazy. So um, it's due to turbulence of flow and, um, and it should be taken very, very seriously. 
Now, um, my colleagues and friends from Paris published this paper in uh, two, 2012, and they were pointing out the differences of multifocal and focal. So focal, the average age of the onset of hypertension is 26. The average age of diagnosis is 30. So this occurs in young, predominantly women. Whereas multifocal, the average age of onset of high blood pressure is age 40, and the average age of diagnosis of FMD was 49, a nine-year delay from onset of hypertension to diagnosis. Those who had focal FMD, 90% of them underwent angioplasty of the renal arteries, where only 35% of multifocal patients did. And if you look at the blood pressures, the blood pressures were often cured with angioplasty in the focal group. In other words, these patients have normal blood pressures on no medications, but the group with multifocal, even the group that is not, um, didn't undergo angioplasty, these patients had their blood pressure very well controlled as well on an average number of patient, uh, medications of two. So just having FMD doesn't mean that you're gonna have resistant hypertension. I think this paper did more to increase the importance of imaging the entire body when you have patients with FMD than any paper that's been published thus far. This is the section in aneurysm in patients with FMD, findings from the US registry. And we had a thousand patients now, as you'll hear from Dr. Gornick, we now have something over 3,500 patients with FMD. And um, in order to make the diagnosis uh, in, an in an artery with an aneurysm or dissection, there has to be FMD elsewhere. And just, this is arteries in the kidney. 22% of patients had an aneurysm somewhere. And the most common places were the kidney artery, the carotid arteries, and the arteries inside the brain, the intracranial arteries. Dissections, and this is an ultrasound showing a tear in the artery. This is showing a tear in the vertebral artery. And dissections occurred in 26% of patients. And the most common place was the carotid artery, the vertebral artery, the kidney artery, and the coronary arteries. And this is not when we didn't even really recognize coronary artery dissection as a manifestation of FMD. It's going to be much more common than this in future reports, I'm certain. So in overall, 42% of patients had an aneurysm or a dissection in some vascular bed. And this has led the consensus of the consensus document to state Regardless of the initial site of vascular bed involvement, patients with FMD should undergo imaging of all vessels from brain to pelvis at least once. We prefer CT angiography. It's got much better resolution than MR angiography. And not only are we looking for FMD in other locations, but we're looking for aneurysms and dissections. Now, there's a misconception, and patients come to me all the time with, I have a 95% narrowing of the artery to my brain, or I have a 80% narrowing of the artery to the kidney. And the point of this is to show you that this is four renal arteries to the kidney. To me, A looks pretty bad. C looks pretty good. Um, but when you put a wire across these and measure the pressure on this side of the artery compared to this side of the artery, you get pressure gradients of 30, 50, 50. So you cannot tell how severe an artery is involved just by looking at it. You have to measure pressure gradients. And the only way to do that is, in, is with an invasive measure at the time you're planning to do an angioplasty if you are planning to do an angioplasty. Now, I just wanted to show this because this more than anything else tells you what's going on in the artery. This is a kidney. You have a catheter through this and you can see you have severe narrowing of the artery to the kidney here. Okay. The image on the right is called optical coherence tomography. 
And if you look down here, you can see the artery being dilated, dilated, narrow, dilated, narrow. And if you watch this, this is the catheter, this is the artery, and these are the little webs that are sticking out. And you can see webs are going to be popping out all over the place. Here's a web. Oh, look, the artery gets really narrow here. So we are right here, and the artery is very narrow. It expands, and you're going to see a dissection in this area, a tear in the artery in this area that you wouldn't see without optical coherence tomography. So let's see if I can get it. Well, we passed it. It's hard to see. And, um, but this is a useful technique if you're not sure what's going on. I uh, want to show you, I like to show this picture because it shows the value of early diagnosis. Um, everyone can see a narrowing of the artery here. She had six months of hypertension. And we did a balloon angioplasty and it opened up quite well. Now, if you look at this artery, it looks normal. So anytime we do an arteriogram on someone, we put a pressure wire through that artery to make sure we're not missing something. Because if we only treat it this side and there was something going on here, the patient would not get a benefit. So look what happens when we put a wire through. You can see this here. And that, when we measured a pressure gradient, it was 50 millimeters of mercury. That means the blood pressure on this side was 170, and the blood pressure on this side was um, 120. So there's a 50 millimeter difference. So we did angioplasty on both sides. Her blood pressure has been cured for now 15 years. So she's been on no blood pressure medication for 15 years because we picked this up early and we treated it appropriately. This is Heather's slide, Dr. Gornick's slide, and it shows why you don't want to stent if you can avoid it. And the reason is you don't need to stent in renal artery, in any uh, FMD. The kidney rotates, goes up and down and rotates. And you can see this entire artery is lined with a stent. And due to the fact that the kidney rotates and goes up and down, it puts enormous stress on the stent and actually you have a stent fracture here. So if you can avoid it, you should avoid the stent. Now I just wanna show you in the next um, five minutes or so uh, about carotid FMD. I like to show this because this patient came to me, I don't know, 10 or 15 years ago, actually 11 years ago. And she brought with her angiograms on film. I mean, we don't even have any places to look at film in the hospital anymore. But she brought her angiograms and she had a carotid angiogram done in the 70s. And it looked exactly what we're seeing right now. So here you can see the string of beads. And you can see it in the vertebral artery. And so there's been no progression of this. And she really came to see me because her blood pressure was out of control. And she had severe FMD of the renal arteries of which we went on to do angioplasty. And her carotid arteries have remained the same over a period of 50 years now. So carotid artery does not progress as long as you don't have a dissection. And carotid artery involvement can present with nonspecific symptoms, dizziness, wooziness, a doctor who listens and hears a brewery, a patient who tells you they have pulsatile tinnitus, a stroke, a subarachnoid hemorrhage, or evaluation after a spontaneous carotid or vertebral dissection. And we've gotten quite good with ultrasound on this because you have to look high up. So if you don't look high up, you're gonna miss this. And a number of patients come to me and understandably, they're very concerned that the doctor told them they had a 70 to 80% narrowing of the carotid artery. And when you look at the velocity of blood flow shown here, 
This in patients with atherosclerosis or hardening of the artery would indicate a 70% narrowing. But it, that doesn't hold up in FMD. You can't put a percent stenosis on. So in our reports, we just say the patient has an elevated velocity, turbulence, and tortuosity consistent with fibromuscular dysplasia. We don't put a degree of narrowing on it because it doesn't give you any information. A word about the S-curve, as you can see here, that's a reverse S-curve. This is, uh, I think this is Heather's picture. We published it in um, circulation in 2014 showing severe distal tortuosity. Here's a patient with a loop in their artery. And here's a CT angiogram. And we did a study on the S-curve and we had 117 patients with FMD. We had, um, for every patient, we had two controls. These are age and sex match. So every patient in this group was the same age as each patient in this group, and they were female. And we had over the age of 70 and sex matched. And what we saw is that a little over a third of the patients had the so-called S-curve, that patients of the same age, only two of them had it, but we don't even know that these two didn't have FMD because this was just an ultrasound study. And 16% of the elderly, if you're using age 70 as the elderly, had an S-curve. So um, we call this the S-curve, a novel morphological finding in patients with FMD. So I think I will stop here. And um, I think uh, I'm on time. And we can go to a question and answer period. Um... Okay, Thank you, Dr. Ahead. Olin. Uh, that was a great presentation and we have a lot of questions. Um, so I just want to let everyone know this is going to be a 10 minute Q&A with Dr. Olin. And at the end of the day, we're going to have a much longer one. Um, I think we're scheduled for 45 minutes and we can take a little bit longer if we need to. So Dr. Olin, one of the first questions, um, are there no histologic, genetic or molecular criteria for the diagnosis of FMD? Yes, absolutely there are. Um, I I did not show them because back in the 1970s, FMD underwent, uh, uh, there was a different terminology used. So for example, what we now call multifocal was called medial fibroplasia. And it was called that based on the hist histology uh, obtained. And the focal FMD was called intimal fibroplasia or periadventitial fibroplasia. The reason we decided to change this, and this was done through a consensus of the group from Belgium and Paris and our group uh, was because we don't get histology anymore. Almost every one of these cases are treated with an endovascular approach, uh, meaning that uh, they're treated with um, stents, balloons, or coiling, and you don't really need um, to open the patient up and do surgery. Uh, so that's why we don't use the histologic diagnosis anymore. We rarely get tissue. Okay, uh, next question. Um, can you discuss what research is currently going on for the FMD-like patients? That's a good question. Um, the, the current research that's going on are discussions with doctors pursue Drs. Gornick and myself. And we've been trying to work out a method to, um, to get these patients together from our three centers and see if the outcomes um, and the prognosis is similar to patients with FMD. Until we get genetic, uh, solid genetic information about fibromuscular dysplasia, there's no point in entering the FMD light patients into the genetic study because we don't even know what the genetics are of FMD. 
So once we once we understand that, then we would put the FMD like patients in and see if in fact it's the same disease or not, which I think it probably is the same disease. And for my friend, Arthur, um, he would like to know what about FMD and aorta? He survived an aortic dissection. So, um, so the string of beads doesn't occur in the aorta, but patients with FMD have a higher prevalence of aneurysms of the aorta than what you would expect for patients of the same age and sex. With that said, um, very few patients in the registry actually had an aortic dissection. I don't know the exact number, but most had aneurysms, but there were some who had aortic dissections. Uh, you'll get much more bang for your buck if you have an aortic dissection looking for some genetic diseases like Marfan's, Lowy's Dietz, vascular Ehlers-Danlos, et cetera, than FMD. But there are cases of FMD in patients who then subsequently had an aortic dissection. Okay. Next, um, are stent fractures common in the renal arteries and should you avoid brain stents? Okay, the renal arteries, you should avoid stenting unless you perforate the artery during the angioplasty and you have to put a stent in. So, um, so you can take care of this properly with angioplasty but every now and then, even if you do everything properly, um, you can get a tear in the artery. And if that occurs, you have to put a stent in. Brain arteries are different. If you have an intracranial aneurysm, they are treated usually with stent-assisted coiling, meaning that a stent is placed and then little coils are placed through the stent into the aneurysm to exclude the aneurysm so it doesn't rupture. So um, that's kind of the difference uh, between a renal artery and a carotid artery. Also, if you're stenting a carotid or vertebral because of a dissection, virtually all the time you should put a stent in. Okay. Um, what would you recommend for patients who have other clinical presentations such as torturosity and bilateral dissections, but no focal or multifocal lesions? What yeah. is the definition of FMD? I, um, I follow a lot of patients like this, many, many patients like this. And actually in that group, I think there's a male preponderance. It can occur in men and women, but I see more men with dissections of the visceral, the abdominal vessels with dissections and aneurysms. Um, but I tell the patient, let's say it's a female patient and they have extreme tortuosity of the carotids and the aorta, and they have a couple of aneurysms and a dissection. I do a genetic evaluation on every one of those patients to make sure we're not missing a genetic disease. And then I tell them for all practical purposes, they behave exactly like someone who has fibromuscular dysplasia. And we put them into the same surveillance imaging program that we would in someone with fibromuscular dysplasia. Now, it's very difficult for these patients. People want to know what the name of the condition they have. Is. And if we can't give them the name of the condition, it leads to a lot of anxiety. And I understand that. But I think we will get this worked out. It's just gonna take a little time. Okay, next question. If degree of narrowing does not predict flow, does it predict progression? Do changing renin levels make a difference? Okay, first of all, renin levels, renin is, for those of you who don't know, renin is uh, uh, an enzyme produced by the kidney that in the presence of another enzyme leads to a hormone that causes the arteries to constrict. They're useless in FMD. We don't even use them. Renin are useful in one condition, excluding or proving primary aldosteronism. That's like in an adrenal gland problem. Um, I didn't say anything about flow. I said that you can't look at an artery and tell how narrow it is. So, uh, but that doesn't mean that the flow is decreased. 
you may have a normal amount of flow. So just because an artery is narrowed, the speed at which the blood goes through that narrowing is increased. So the flow may actually be the same. And the thing is, if you have it in the renal artery, I'm talking about multifocal string of beads, and you have high blood pressure, and you're having a difficult time um, getting it under control, or you can't tolerate the medications, then, um, then you go ahead and you do an angiogram and measure pressure gradients. And if there's a pressure gradient, you do an angioplasty. And you do the angioplasty until you can get rid of the pressure gradient. Once the pressure gradient's gone, you're done. You have a successful result, at least angiographically. Okay, and then there's a question uh, about stenting. Is it safe? Um, and I can say for the patients that have um, carotid stents, I have bilateral carotid stents, and mine were placed 20 years ago, and I'm doing just great. I don't know, Jeff, if you want to elaborate on carotid stenting. Yeah, I mean, um, car carotid stenting for FMD alone is not recommended under most situations. In other words, it's very unusual to have a stroke from FMD, I'm talking about the string of beads FMD, not focal FMD, to have a stroke just from beating of the carotid arteries. The strokes occur in patients who have dissections. And out of every 100 patients that have a dissection in the carotid or vertebral arteries, 30% will have a stroke. So depending on what the dissection looks like would depend on whether or not you would go ahead and put a stent in. But if it looks like it needs a stent, then it's entirely safe to do it as long as the person doing it has treated patients with FMD before and is experienced at putting stents in the carotid and vertebral arteries. In that situation, it's very safe. Okay. Um, right. I, Pam, I think, I think we probably have to move on, right? Yes, it's 10 o'clock. Yep. Okay. okay. So, so we're going to take I, I, a quick break. Oh, yeah, that's right. And we'll come back in 15 minutes? Correct. So we will come back at 10.15. Okay, thank you. We've got a lot of great questions, and we'll pick up on those later this afternoon. <laughs> 